Happy New Year. Welcome to Legislatively Speaking, the third of our four-part Maryland legislative series. We are thrilled that so many of you are joining us online this morning. For your information, this program is being recorded. I'm Bobby Shulman, and it is my pleasure to serve along with my friend and colleague, Todd Rosenberg, as co-chair of the JCRC's Maryland Commission. The JCRC is the public affairs and community relations arm of the suburban Maryland, Northern Virginia, and DC organized Jewish community, and home to more than 300,000 Jewish people, the third largest Jewish community in the country. The JCRC represents more than 100 organizations, synagogues, and the Jewish Federation in advocating for the needs and priorities and values of the Jewish community and the well being of everyone in the greater Washington region. Each year, our grassroots advocacy includes convening you, our community, for education and discussion and for in person meetings with legislators at the federal, state, and local levels. Since we can hold our annual legislative breakfast in person this year, we are bringing our elected officials and legislative priorities to you through this online legislative series. A week from today on January 13th, the Maryland General Assembly opens. To give you a preview of the session, we are pleased to host Maryland State Senator Susan Lee and Delegate Al Carr. Our guests will speak for 10 minutes each on their priorities for the upcoming year and address the JCRC's Maryland legislative priorities. They can be found on the website at jcouncil.org. Following these remarks, our executive director, Ron Halber, will moderate a discussion with our guests. Please put your questions in the Q&A box and Ron will get to as many as time permits. <clears throat> It is now my pleasure to introduce Senator Susan Lee. Senator Lee, an attorney who represents District 16, was reelected to her second Senate term in November 2018. She is the first Asian American elected to the Maryland State Senate and is majority whip. She is a member of the Judicial Proceedings Committee, the Governor's Family Violence Committee, Safe Harbor Youth, and Victims of, of Human Trafficking Work Group. She co-chairs the Maryland Cybersecurity Council's Law and Public Policy Subcommittee, has chaired the Maryland Legislative Asian American and Pacific Islander Caucus, and is a past president of the Women's Legislative Caucus. She previously served for 13 years in the Maryland House of Delegates. Among her many accomplishments, Senator Lee has been a leader in passing landmark laws to fight domestic violence, human and labor trafficking, child and senior abuse, sexual assault and hate crimes, to name but a few. She authored and led passage of one of the strongest pay equity laws in the country, a law against exploitation and laws that fight mass violence and terror against schools and places of worship. During last year's shortened session, she managed to lead passes of, of laws to help two human trafficking victims and protect victims of domestic violence and child predators and strengthen pay equity. Welcome, Senator Lee. Thank you so much. Uh, th thank you for that generous introduction too. And thank you to everyone uh, for having this um, event today uh, because um, you know I look forward to it every year, but this year, we're in a new normal, so it was kind of difficult to have it, but I'm so glad that we can still do it. And uh, and anyway, I thank everyone, the whole leadership for all your advocacy uh, during the normal, during the time when we didn't have the pandemic, coming down to Annapolis and helping us pass bills to um, uplift and empower uh, all hardworking individuals, um, families, children, women, um, you, you have made a difference. So I thank you and thank you for sharing your priorities with us before the session starts because we wanna do all that we can to help you too. Because uh, most of your priorities are our priorities. I was just reading that and I said, wow, that's great. Um, that's exactly what we wanna do. And that's exactly what we're gonna help you do with your priorities. There are a lot of challenges we have um, during this uh, session because um, it's, uh, it's gonna be difficult because of the virus, the pandemic. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a new normal and uh, I'm going to just go over here and tell you what, what's gonna happen. Um, but I also want uh, everyone to uh, 
to keep Congressman Jamie Raskin and his family in your prayers and thoughts at the passing of his dear son, Tommy. Uh, Congressman Raskin and uh, Sarah Raskin, as you know, provided a loving and moving tribute to their son and, and created a memorial fund in his name. So, and you can probably see that online. Um, and as uh, Bobby said, um, in the Senate, um, the majority whip and a member of the Judicial Proceedings Committee. And it's a real honor uh, to serve and represent you, along with my District 16 colleagues, uh, Delegates Ariana Kelly, uh, Mark Corman, and Sarah Love. And um, we also like to thank you, everyone, for your personal sacrifices that you've made and the wearing of masks and practicing social distancing. You know, it's been very difficult for all of us and our families. This deadly pandemic has created um, just a new way that we have to operate and do our business. And uh, we, we, we will get through it, but I hope that we can all get through it together, working together. A as you uh, know, the 2020 session was uh, one of the most challenging we've ever had because we had to shorten it and end it early. And this hasn't been done since the Civil War. And so a lot of bills, uh, even though they got hearings, uh, they didn't get a vote on it because we had to end so early. So um, I'd like to uh, t tell you what did pass uh, quickly because uh, the, one of them may have to be on a fetal override. I had a bill to require background checks on the sale of long guns and short, short shotguns by unlicensed uh, or private dealers. Uh, this this uh, bill was so important, and I know that you all advocated on, because it would ban those, uh, or essentially prevent those who are banned by law from getting a gun, going around the law and purchasing them. Unfortunately, despite all the work that we did on it, uh, the Governor Hogan vetoed the bill. So we're hoping with your help that we can override that veto when we go back into session. And I'd also like to thank you all for supporting my pay equity bill that passed uh, that uh, would ban employers from requiring salary history from, from applicants instead of using objective standards. And so this will get us closer to closing the, the uh, pay gap between um, uh, women, people of color, and people that just decided to work in the public sector, but they don't want to carry that low salary range to every, each and every job. And thank you to for helping me pass the True Freedom Act of 2020, which uh, enables human trafficking victims to vacate nonviolence minor offenses committed because they were forced to do it because they were trafficked. And uh, this will allow them to escape their traffickers, recover and rebuild their lives. And, and thank you for helping me pass the, a major domestic violence bill to make strangulation a first degree uh, felony instead of just a mere slap on the on the risk second degree assault, and also my bills to uh, protect domestic violence victims and and to protect children against predators. So that was that was what the bills are able to squeak by and get passed. Um, the 2021 session um, is going to be even more challenging. Uh, so we were so happy to hear uh, that Congress uh, passed and. Uh, Trump, President Trump signed a bill to provide $900 billion in uh, coronavirus relief assistance. Of course, I don't think it's enough, but hopefully uh, we may have a new Congress going in that will, will be a little bit, um, provide more um, leadership and relief uh, to fight this pandemic and also to help families get back on uh, track because, uh, you know, what, what the pandemic has has done and devastated everybody's lives. Uh, the states um, are not only uh, expecting to get that $600 in direct payments for adults or uh, who, who make up to 75,000 per year or, or 2,400 for a family of four, but also funding to help our small businesses, uh, to help with rental assistance, uh, with education funding, public transit, with food stamps and also child nutritional benefits, which many of uh, are your priorities too. And in Maryland, one of our highest priorities is getting Marylanders um, through this. Uh, and now that the vaccine distribution has begun, but also conducting important business in the state, uh, safety of course will be our highest priorities. 
Uh, in the Senate, we have been limited uh, to 20 bills per member with uh, some exceptions. And the hearings will only allow four witnesses for a bill and four witnesses against a bill. And um, we will also uh, be meeting on the floor only two days a week. The rest of the days will be in hearings, uh, committee hearings of all sorts. And we'll be presiding over, of course, the veto overrise of some perhaps 30 plus bills that the governor vetoed. Uh, we're living, of course, in a time when we're facing uh, one some of the most serious challenges in the history of our country, but also our state with that, with the virus still ongoing and there's such a bad economic downturn and protests uh, calling for the end of injustices with of course the killing of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and other incidences and the very foundations of our democracy now being uh, tested and challenged even today as we speak. Uh, in Maryland, um, we believe, uh, I know that Delegate Carr and I, we believe that uh, as legislators, we have a responsibility to address systemic injustice and inequality. And that I know is, is what your leadership has also, uh, also supported to and is dedicated to. So we're so glad to have you having our back front and side too. Uh, because we, we feel that if we don't do anything, now, um, our children and grandchildren will have to address this, and we just don't want to leave a world where they have to deal with all the problems that existed when we could have taken care of it. Um, over the interim, uh, my committee, which is the Senate Judicial Proceedings Committee, and the House Judiciary Committee, we've been having numerous online hearings and briefings on the subject of police misconduct and the inequities in our criminal justice system. As a result, um, in 20, our 2021 session will probably include a lot of bills dealing with addressing that issue of police uh, accountability, of um, issues like um, uh, transparency training, uh, including bias trainings, best practices, recruitment protocols, and banning the excessive use of force, such as the use of chokeholds and abandoning the acquisition of federal combat military equipment by local police and to require more reporting and data collection and greater transparency in investigations by using independent investigators or special prosecutors where there has been incidences of death in police custody or uh, egregious alleged mis police misconduct. And of course, critical to keeping our uh, ourselves and our community safe is having a law enforcement that uh, are working as our guardians and our partners who, um, who we can feel we can trust them and we can uh, work with them to solve crimes and keep our families safe. So uh, that is the goal that we have. Uh, we, we also will be having bills to protect the rights of immigrants, uh, particularly against unlawful detentions. Uh, by ICE without a judicial warrant and the prohibiting of ICE from going into uh, Maryland's uh, Department of Motor Vehicles database and just fishing for information without any kind of restrictions or controls. And there will be a bill, of course, to help with coronavirus relief assistance, including bills to protect tenants from being evicted during the pandemic caused by an inability to pay or uh, because of uh, you know, the, the lack of uh, employment or, or things related to COVID-19 that have occurred during the pandemic. And then bills to, um, to, to protect homeowners too from foreclosures or late fees during the pandemic. And of course, a bill dealing with uh, paid family and medical leave. Uh, I'll, for my own bills, I will be introducing, in addition to, uh, to co-sponsoring those bills, uh, some of them, I will be uh, introducing bills to fight domestic violence, gun violence, child abuse and neglect, and cyber attacks, and also to promote cybersecurity. One of my uh, bills that was introduced last year that, but did not get a vote or was just delayed because of the, um, the, the shortening of our session is a bill that passed overwhelmingly in the House but didn't get a vote in the Senate with, is a bill to repeal spousal defense in cases of sexual assault or rape. 
Maryland's current law allows this defense if you're married and is based on an archaic, uh, out, out of touch idea that women are property. Uh, right now, non-married couples who live together have more protections if there's a sexual assault or rape. So I, we, we view this as an injustice. I also have a bill to regulate the manufacture of what they call ghost guns. Ghost guns can be manufactured or created with a 3D printer or by other means. Uh, unfortunately, these types of guns do not have serial numbers on them. So they are untraceable and they are often used in crimes. And so we, we want to be able to uh, decrease gun violence uh, by requiring um, regulating and requiring certain uh, re requirements for when you have a ghost gun. Um, also, as, as uh, Bobby indicated, uh, the co-chair of the Maryland Cybersecurity Council uh, on Law and Policy, and will again be bringing forth bills that have been brought before our council. Uh, one will be a bill to proactively fight what they call ransomware. I think many people know what ransomware by making it a crime to possess ransomware with a malicious intent to use it. And also to make it a felony if it is used uh, to attack a hospital, a school, or other vital infrastructure. As you know, ransomware can paralyze hospitals, local governments, and law enforcement and vital infrastructures as it has been done. Uh, if you've been hearing the news about reports of this malicious ransomware shutting down governments such as Baltimore City, which was shut down for weeks and it cost the city over 15 million to recover, and also the attack against the Salisbury Police Department. Uh, I will also be uh, introducing what is called the Maryland Online Consumer Protection Act, which is modeled after California, to require the consent uh, before commercial entities can use your personal information about you, uh, and they, they, before they can transfer it, sell it, uh, um, and also have an automatic opt-out for children, the use of children's personal information. So that that's part of uh, that's going to be a hard bill to, to pass because uh, we got to get all the stakeholders together. And um, I also have a bill to enable the Department of Information Technology to assist our localities uh, with resources and strategies for developing proactive strategic cyber plans and strategies so they can. Um, they can avoid a cyber attack and also be equipped to deal with it rapidly if it does happen. And a bill to require manufacturers to have security features on the internet things. Again, I don't wanna go on too long because I'd love Al to tell you what they're doing in the House of Delegates. Thank you again for the honor and privilege of uh, letting me represent and serve you in the Maryland State Senate, even with all the challenges we have today. Let's work together to get through these trying times. Of course, as the history of our country attests, uh, in America, when we unite and we work together, we can confront and overcome the gravest of adversity. And again, thank you so much. Thank you, Senator Lee. My name is Todd Rosenberg and I serve as co-chair of the Maryland Commission of the JCRC. It's my honor to welcome my friend, Delegate Al Carr. Delegate Carr is Vice Chair of the Montgomery County Delegation, Maryland House of Delegates, representing District 18. A member of the Democratic Party, Delegate Carr has written and successfully secured passage of legislation for environmental protection, education, open government, community parks, affordable housing, public safety, transportation, and other matters. He has received top ratings and awards from groups advocating for conservation, civil rights, municipal government, and consumer protection. Delegate Carr was elected to the House of Delegates in 2007 and serves on the Health and Government Operations Committee. He's the chair of its Metropolitan Washington Committee. He is the House Chair of the Joint Committee on Federal Relations. He formerly served as elected council member and mayor pro tem for the town of Kensington. Delegate Carr has 20 years of private sector experience in business management, sales, marketing, and engineering. He spent most of his career in the field of telecommunications and has been recognized for his leadership and innovation. Delegate Carr, thank you for being here this morning. Uh, thank you so much for that uh, introduction and good morning to everybody. Happy New Year. Um, so 
uh, I appreciate you you having me. I appreciate all all that you do to uh, to advocate, uh, and really appreciate your uh, legislative agenda that you kindly shared uh, with us. So, uh, in addition to Senator Raskin's son, please uh, keep in your thoughts uh, former District 18 Senator Rich Madalino, who recently lost his uh, father to COVID-19, uh, and I know that um, we're keeping in our thoughts uh, everyone you know, who has lost loved ones uh, recently uh, or are, are suffering during these hard times. So I was uh, first appointed to the House of Delegates in 2007 uh, in December. And uh, my first legislative session was in 2008. The, uh, the, the first thing that happened early in my career was the, the Great Recession uh, with uh, the crisis in the housing market and in the, the greater economy. And what I learned out of that is that uh, governing is, uh, is harder when there are economic problems. And I think in some ways we're still recovering from the, uh, the Great Recession of, of 2008, 2009. Um, but I didn't know at that time what the future held. I didn't know that I would still be in office in uh, 2016 and then the years leading up to 2020 with all the challenges that we are facing in uh, addition to uh, the rise of uh, anti-immigrant sentiment and uh, nationalism and hate uh, towards towards so many groups uh, and the uh, this sort of dismantling of our common good and our, our uh, institutions and our democracy and then in 2020 with uh, the the pandemic and all the challenges that it brings and the financial fallout from the pandemic we have so many people who are, are hurting, who uh, have lost loved ones, who are having health challenges, who are struggling economically. They have either uh, lost their jobs or they've been forced to give up their jobs. Uh, it's uh, difficult for folks to get uh, childcare. Folks have, if they haven't lost their jobs, maybe they're working reduced hours or, uh, or they've had their uh, pay cut. We have a lot of people struggling to keep a roof over their heads, to keep their, their families fed. Uh, but in tough times, um, that is when, even though governing is harder, um, that's I think when it's most important that we, uh, that we, we lead and we govern with our hearts. And I think uh, you know, with the encouraging results in November and yesterday, we have uh, such a great opportunity to, uh, to uh, not just repair the damage that was done in the last four years, but uh, to really uh, make things better for a lot of people. So uh, that's what I'm going to keep in mind as we go into this legislative session to, um, uh, to address so many challenges. And as Senator Lee said, this is a legislative session that will be conducted very differently than in the past because of the pandemic. It's going to be largely virtual. So most of the work that happens in legislati legislatively is in uh, committees. And uh, the, the committee uh, system is gonna be largely virtual. So all the bill hearings will be uh, virtual, conduct on Zoom, just like we're doing right now. And uh, subcommittee meetings will also be virtual and people will be able to, to watch them. Committee voting sessions will be virtual. So even though it'll be different in some ways, the General Assembly will be more accessible because it'll be possible to observe and participate in a lot of the activities, these activities without having to travel to Annapolis. Um, so so uh, some challenges, but also some, some good things there on the occasions where we will have to convene physically in the House of Delegates, we've uh, separated ourselves into two separate rooms. We have our main chamber and our annex. 
in a different building and we're going to operate um, as one house of delegates linked electronically and we'll be able to complete our, our work and do our business and, and vote on things when we have to meet as a uh, as a uh, House of Delegates chamber and body. We'll be convening on the first day of session on Wednesday, January 13th, and then we'll take a break for probably for about a month to, to do our uh, committee work. So, but I look forward to working with all of you in this upcoming session to uh, advance your priorities and all the things that we that we have in common. Just to, to add to what Senator Lee said, some of the big issues that I think we'll be facing in uh, the upcoming session, you know, of course, they're the one thing that we are required to do in the Maryland Constitution is to pass a balanced budget. Uh, so we will be working on that. The revenue picture is not as bad as the worst case scenario that was uh, anticipated early on. So that, that's good news, but we still have a lot of challenges to work on uh, to, to balance our budget. And you know, I'm one who's not in favor of an austerity budget where we're gonna cut services uh, to the detriment of uh, vulnerable Marylanders. On the healthcare front, I am on the Health and Government Operations Committee, and we will be uh, exercising closer oversight over uh, COVID testing. You know, there's been there have been a lot of um, criticisms and discussion about the the testing regime in Maryland, how that's rolled out, how that's progressing. Of course, testing is critical for us to get control of this uh, pandemic. And also the vaccine distribution. I think that was even one of the, the Q&A questions was why is Maryland slower than uh, other states? And uh, I responded in the chat with some information. Our chair of our committee uh, sent a letter to the Maryland Department of Health just a few days ago. You can see that, you can see the response. And uh, also our governor had a briefing yesterday at 5 p.m. that you can watch on YouTube where he talked about his philosophy about the uh, the vaccine distribution distribution. I'm getting so many questions from constituents about on that topic. We are going to look at uh, some of the temporary provisions that were put in place for the pandemic, like telehealth. A lot of folks are seeing their doctors on via the phone or video conferencing or, or Zoom, and those uh, those measures. Many of them should be made permanent, not just, not just for the pandemic. We'll be uh, looking at issues of uh, equity in our healthcare system. I think issues of uh, disparities and equity, they're not new, but I think the pandemic has sort of exposed them and we'll be continue to work to address those issues. And uh, of course, affordability, medical debt, prescription drug cost, um, and I'll have an opportunity to directly participate in those conversations as a member of that committee. Uh, housing, we will be looking closely at um, the issues of uh, foreclosures for homeowners. We have a lot of folks that are struggling to pay their mortgages and other folks that are struggling to pay their rent. Uh, and of course, landlords, they have mortgages too. So we'll be looking to for ways that we can ease those burdens on the education front, uh, of course, we'll be considering the blueprint for Maryland's future that the governor vetoed last year. We're going to uh, look at ways to improve broadband access now that broadband has become as critical as electricity for students to learn at home or for uh, those who are able to work from home to be able to connect. Um, uh, and we'll address the issues of equitable funding for historically black colleges and universities. Um, Senator Lee talked a lot about criminal justice reform. That'll be a big area of focus. If you go to the Maryland General Assembly uh, website homepage, you can click on the final report of the House's work group to address police reform and accountability in Maryland uh, to get a, an idea of uh, what some of the conversations are gonna be and elections. So the 2020 election in Maryland, the primary and the general elections were conducted very differently than in previous years. And I think we're gonna look at all the lessons that were learned 
and figure out ways that we can uh, do even better in future elections and better accommodate early voting and mail-in voting. And then finally on the economic front, we'll be looking at uh, uh, all the ways we can assist individuals and families who are, are struggling. We've had a, many, many challenges with uh, the Department of Labor in their administration of the unemployment insurance system. I think that uh, it's been unprecedented, the number of individuals who have become so frustrated at trying to access the benefits that they're due through either through uh, state benefits or federal benefits that are administered through the state for unemployment insurance. You have people who are actually figuring out that they have a delegate or a senator and finding out their names and finding out how to reach them and contacting us because they're not able to get the results they need through their, their, the normal channels of working through the Department of Labor. And just to, turning to my, my own legislative agenda, the things that I'll be personally championing this year in the legislative session, um, one has to do with the, the safety net. So, so in addition to, to renters, um, we have a great program in Maryland called the Homeowners Tax Credit, which benefits vulnerable uh, Maryland homeowners and especially seniors. This, this program has been around for, for a long time. It helps a lot of people, but uh, it was recently revealed that the state agency that administers this program was shortchanging these vulnerable Marylanders. They weren't calculating the credits properly and uh, people were being shortchanged by you know, hundreds or even thousands of dollars. Um, so what we need to do is to uh, make people whole and uh, go back in time and, and give people refunds for uh, the amounts that they would have been due had that uh, tax credit been calculated correctly. Uh, I'll also be focusing on open government because uh, um, we can accomplish all of our goals better when, when uh, government is open and accountable and transparent. So I'll be looking at making improvements to the state's uh, spending transparency database to updating the Maryland Public Information Act to address some uh, loopholes that agencies sometimes abuse. Uh, I have a local bill that makes our local housing agency in Montgomery County more uh, transparent and, and accountable. And then another one that is aimed at our um, Maryland Department of Transportation and how their projects are uh, reviewed. Uh, I'll also continue my focus on, on uh, transportation policies, um, trying to address the harmful issues when, when people accumulate toll debt or traffic debt and get, can get trapped in, um, uh, and have their registration suspended that with uh, severe consequences at times and some other measures aimed at um, uh, improving safety for drivers and for pedestrians. On, uh, on the environmental front, I have a local bill that will uh, address and protect our tree canopy where you've seen the orange trucks that drive around our neighborhoods and, and uh, butcher trees sometimes needlessly in the name of ele electric reliability. But the truth is that uh, most of the reliability problems we've had with electricity have been related to equipment failures, not trees. So we need a better balance in, uh, in uh, keeping the power on, but also protecting that, that uh, tree canopy. And then finally, uh, I've got a bill with Senator Lamb that uh, uh, improves the licensing regime for genetic counselors in Maryland. So, um, I really look forward to uh, all of your questions. Thank you again for having me. Delegate Carr, thank you very, very much. And Senator Susan Lee, thank you so much. It's, I've known both of you for I don't know, about two decades now. Um, uh, as a, I always like to say Delegate Carr and I were in the same birthing class with our wives when we were both pregnant with our first children 18 years ago. And Delegate Susan Lee and I had the wonderful pleasure of going on a trip to Israel, which is, must be about 15, 16 years ago already. And uh, so we know each other a long time. And it's a pleasure to have watched you both 
grow and assume positions of responsibility and leadership. And we're very proud that we have both of you um, in Maryland uh, leading our efforts and advocating on behalf of our community and for the people of Maryland. Uh, my name is Ron Halber. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the executive director of the Jewish Community Relations Council. And I wanted to thank our senator and our delegate for giving us very, very comprehensive, um, very comprehensive briefings. And usually I have lots of questions prepared in advance. The problem is they've answered most of them. So I'm going to do, but I have a couple, uh, a couple that, I, that may prove interesting. One of them, oh, before I do it, I do want to note the presence of my very dear friend, um, uh, Senator Chris Van Hollen's uh, state director, uh, Joan Kleinman, and thank her for joining with us here today. Um, and uh, so the first question is comes from my friend Isaac Schneider, who talks about the, the fact that during the uh, COVID epidemic, both opioid abuse has gone up and so, and there's been a very big strain on our mental health system um, in terms of people. People are feeling isolated, people are feeling alone, people <coughs> are feeling the need for, uh, uh, for um, uh, uh, um, uh, for socialization, and I'm wondering if there's any state efforts underway that you might know of, or what might be done to help this. First, I'll go to Susan, uh, does, uh, excuse me, Senator Lee, and then I will go to Delegate Carr. So, anything about opioid abuse and mental health uh, assistance? Yeah, um, I I don't know how much, many bills will be on that this year because of the challenges we have with the pandemic and everything's being done online. But I do know that the legislature, uh, before we left in 2020, we did pass um, uh, bills to increase uh, the use of telehealth. Telehealth has been um, been uh, shown all over the country, probably. That it works in, in cases of dealing with mental health issues. And we, um, a long time ago, when I was in the House of Delegates, I introduced the first telemedicine bill uh, to allow doctors to get reimbursed for telemedicine. Now, telemedicine has become uh, a terminology called telehealth now, and it's been expanded. And a lot of my colleagues uh, have introduced bills to expand telehealth, and one area is mental health. I can tell you, for example, that the Jewish Social Service Agency relies, which is one of the largest providers of non-sectarian mental health services in our in, in, in Montgomery County, relies on telehealth for its licensed social workers and psychologists to meet with their uh, patients to provide them with that critical access. Yeah, yeah, it's a wonderful tool, and I think now with this pandemic um, and this new norm, uh, telehealth will be expanded, just like we're doing telework now. But telehealth has been so effective in terms of follow-up visits uh, because uh, patients and, um, and physicians and social workers, they, they can meet uh, online and they can go over uh, you know, some of their diagnosis. N not everything can be done telehealth, but a lot of things can. And it's a very useful tool in terms of um, follow-up and, um, and in this uh, particular area. So I see it getting more expanded, and but we do need uh, your help in urging our other colleagues and also the governor to support funding for the expansion of telehealth, but also for substance abuse and right. and that uh, that was a high priority, I know during the last session, and I'm hoping that it will be in this session. I am not on the committee that deals with uh, funding for that, but uh, we will doesn't mean we can't get involved. And urging our colleagues to make sure that there is funding for that. And I, I think Delegate Carr could probably expand on that a little bit more. What's going on in the House? Please, Delegate Carr. Yeah, so, right. So the, the, the issue of uh, opioid abuse and it, mental health, yes. And mental health, uh, you know, these are not new issues. These are issues that we've been working on in the Maryland General Assembly for, for years. And I think maybe the pandemic has sort of uh, brought, renewed the, or maybe brought them to light in different ways, but I, the, the priority, the need to address them is, is, is still there. Maybe it's more urgent. So I expect that we will, we will continue to focus on um, uh, opioid abuse, substance abuse issues. How can we best reduce harm and, and help struggling people? And then uh, mental health care is, is critical. We need to, to continue to do everything we can to reduce the stigma of uh, mental illness, to make mental health services uh, accessible to all, uh, affordable, 
Um, so uh, I, and the, the pandemic and the economy uh, do exacerbate, I think, uh, mental health challenges. So I do expect that we'll be, we'll be uh, really looking closely at, at how we can uh, redouble our efforts in that regard. Yeah, we have to also partner with the federal government too. And we're hoping with this new um, uh, coronavirus uh, re relief assistance that we will get some money from the uh, federal government to uh, supplement what we've been doing in the state. Do you uh, have any idea about where that specific money can be used within the state budget to help alleviate some of the stress from COVID, uh, the, the federal money, starting with the uh, delegate car and then going to uh, uh, Senator Susan Lee? Like where that federal money can be most pointed and most effective and absorbed into the state budget to, to help supplement state efforts? Sure. And I, I think that. Uh counties and, and states and municipalities were, were hoping for more and sort of more flexible assistance from the federal government. And, uh, and I think there's hope that that may happen in the future, but th there are really so many needs, um, um, you know, the, the safety net, I think um, is an area of huge need, keeping people um, in, you know, secure housing, um, and uh, assistance with their utilities. Those are two, two big areas um, that I think um, um, you know, need to be addressed. But I think every, you know, every sector, you can't, there, there's not a sector of uh, government or life that you can't point to that is not, uh, that won't be able to benefit from, from some of this relief from the federal government. Thank you, uh, Senator Oli. My understanding is, and we don't know how much is going to get allocated to states yet, or which states, is that uh, from what was passed, it was like $284 billion for, uh, for small businesses, which really need help a lot, uh, and uh, $25 billion for direct rental assistance, which is uh, important because you don't want people getting evicted during a pandemic and becoming homeless. And then 82 billion for education funding. I'm not exactly sure how that's going to translate uh, with the states. And 45 billion in public transit systems, and 30, 13 billion in increased food stamps and child uh, nutritional benefits. And then they're they're going to extend the moratorium on evictions until the end of the month. So that, but because it was just passed, uh, we we don't know how it's going to be allocated, but we hope to. Uh, and we hope in this new Congress uh, that we will get more cooperation and partnership between the states and the federal government because it's, that is critical to helping us, especially during this pandemic. And there's an other, another thing too. There is a move now by um, the state and localities to ask Governor Hogan to uh, take some money from the Rainy Day Fund. Because right now, rainy day fun was created for just this type of situation. There's a lot of rain, right? Yeah. So, well, I mean, we don't want to take all of the rainy day fun, but we want to take right. some of it to help us get through this uh, economic downturn. And also critical is uh, now that we have a vaccine developed, the important thing is distribution, is how it's getting distributed. And, and uh, they're, they've been having a lot of problems with distribution. And unfortunately, because uh, you know, Operation Warp Speed was not actually very warp speed. Uh, the President uh, Trump, the, the current president right now, had promised that we get like 20 million people vaccinated, and it's been like only like two mil, two million, not 20. And uh, also, there's been a lot of confusions because we we haven't had like a um, consistent, uh, you know, nationwide strategic plan as to how we're gonna deal with the pandemic, much less uh, the vaccine. So uh, there's a lot of initial problems in getting it out to whoever is entitled to get it. Right now, we're, uh, the distribution in our state is to the, uh, the category of 1, 1A. 1A are those that, uh, you know, healthcare providers, uh, those that are at the forefront at, uh, in the healthcare industry. Uh, 1A includes healthcare workers, long-term facilities, care staff, and first responders. And they're still in the process of doing 1A. Uh, the governor said in his press conference yesterday that uh, 
maybe we will uh, be able to get to 1B, which includes people with higher risks or underlying conditions um, by the end of January. Hopefully we can accomplish that. And to get into 1C, which is um, people that are age 65 and 70 to 75, uh, and um, to expand this group and to get that done by March of 2021 of our year. And then hopefully uh, later on, I I'm hoping that we, we get to the stage where we can get it to everybody soon. Yeah, I would encourage you, by the way, that there are groups of people who do provide health care who are not necessarily considered health care workers. For example, sometimes you have people who work in hospice care who take care of individuals and you have people who work with those assisting those who live in group homes, such as those operated by JFGH, who are not may not be on the priority list. So I, I would encourage you to use your good offices to make sure that, um, that, that, that you know, there's a lot of people who provide health assistance who may not necessarily be certified. And that is a very important thing because a lot of these individuals are providing the basic care that help maintain people's life or at least make them comfortable during the latter stages of life. And um, we actually wrote to the governor about including those in his, um, in his priority list. Uh, you know, if we keep vaccinating at a rate of a million a day, we're not even going to hit the full population by the end of by the end of this year. And um, one of the questions was, does the state legislator have any role in um, in helping to um, roll out the vaccine faster? Obviously, it seems to be a federal controlled function that is given to the states that is determined by the public health. But is there a, is there a state legislative role in this vaccination process? Well, certainly, we're not going to just stand by and see all this uh, unfolding in front of us and, and not it, it being not efficient. We certainly uh, we're 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 communicating, working with the governors as much as we can and all the local, we're, we're partnering, the locals, the state, we're partnering together to try to, uh, to make this uh, rollout as efficient as possible, but there's a lot of glitches because sometimes when uh, the federal government gets you these vaccines, okay, uh, it's on short notice and then they give it to the localities and, you know, they have to be prepared to be able to uh, to give the vac to vac start the vaccination process, mm -hmm. so they're you know they don't have much time to prepare. But I, I thank you so much, Ron, for bringing up the the um, importance of including those other individuals who provide health care and hospice, um, but are not considered uh, health care health care workers that would get the uh, vaccine vac vaccine or be included in the one but even cho even children who take care yeah. of their elderly parents on a uh, who take care of their elderly parents who are unable yeah, to afford other assistance they, yeah they probably didn't think about that when they were doing this vaccine rollout i think uh, our role is to advise the governor on that and that he's got to probably expand some of these categories to include those types of workers or those children and i think he is doing that right now uh, from what i heard in the uh, his press conference yesterday, he's expanding the definitions of what is um, what what is included in different groups. Like um, like one uh, C will include other individuals, like uh, people that are in the grocery, that work in grocery stores, transit, agricultural, and manufacturers. And then uh, phase two will include uh, sixteen to uh, age sixteen to sixty four ages. So. Um, we're, our role is to help in this too. And even though the distribution starts with the federal government, goes to the state, and then the state, uh, the, the governor gives it to the localities, the localities have to implement how they feel proper. Right. So here's an interesting question from our past president, uh, Harvey Ryder, who said, um, can you took a little, can you took a little bit, talk a little bit more about addressing medical debt is, issues um, you know, a lot of people end up in these large, um, uh, have, end up with having these large balances due to lack of health insurance or just a, a extreme expense of medical debt that can devastate families for years to come. And I just wanted to know if there's any efforts underway or if you've heard of anything that might be, uh, um, that might be dealing with these issues during this legislative session. Um, or, I, I, we'll we'll down. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you, Senator. So um, yeah, medical debt is a, is a very big issue in my committee, the Health and Government Operations Committee. Yes. That was a big focus um, last year. 
in the 2020 legislative session, we had two great bills. One that we passed was from Delegate Robin Lewis um, from Baltimore City. And uh, another bill that didn't pass was from Delegate Laura Charcutian from Montgomery County. So uh, we did make a lot of progress on that issue, but there's, there's a long ways to go. So I would look for Delegate Charcutian's bill on medical debt. And there's an organization called National Nurses United that has been sort of the lead advocate on the, the, that issue because um, you know, they're seeing it from a health provider perspective and they're seeing that um, um, it really inhibits people from seeking medical care when you have this threat of you know, I go and get care, am I going to, um, you know, be taken to court over a small amount of medical debt, or am I going to have my wages garnished? And this is, you know, happening not just to the general population, but to the healthcare, healthcare workers themselves, you know, who go in for treatment, we're getting this. So um, hugely important issue that uh, I know that we'll be, we'll talking about this in the upcoming session. Let me ask you, um about, um, it's interesting, uh, uh, two issues that, that have come up. One is that the, the governor's veto last year of uh, providing 500 and approximately $550 million over a 10 year period to historically black colleges and universities in, um, in, in Maryland. Do you have any idea what prompted that veto? And um, do you think that money will be restored? And then my sec and then one final question after that, if there's anything you want to address on environmental issues, and then I think we're about done. So the historical black college uh, uh, funding mechanism and environmentalism, I guess we can start with Senator, uh, we just did with Delegate Carson, we'll start with Senator Lee. Yes, I, I was surprised that he had vetoed that. I, I was very disappointed too. And that's probably uh, a bill that will be in consideration for a veto override. I think it's the first bill actually coming up if I yeah, think it's HB1. And, uh, I think. Because I, I think it was it was historic that we even passed it in the 2020 session. And a lot of us were really overjoyed and happy because uh, it should have been done decades ago, but um, in years ago, but uh, we finally got it passed and then to have a veto was extremely disappointing. We hope that we will, uh, it'll be one of the bills that's going to be uh, on the veto override. And uh, anything you'd like to add, uh, Senator, on uh, environmental priorities this session? Senator, can you hear me? Okay. I think the Senator may be having some difficulty. Uh, De Delegate Carr, do you want to address the issue of the historical black colleges and the um, and any environmental protection measures that are um, coming up this session? Uh, sure, yeah. So our historically black colleges and universities are, are hugely important and they have such a, a role in Maryland with uh, so many great institutions that, that we uh, that we have. I mean, my, my dad uh, graduated from HBCUs um, for uh, undergraduate as well as his uh, medical school, Howard University, right here. So uh, I know how, how important that, that they are and the importance of having equity and, and equitable uh, funding. Um, so yes, so uh, House Bill 1 and Senate Bill 1, instead of a veto override, um, there were some issues that required uh, those uh, bills to just be reintroduced as brand new bills. So that, that'll be a top priority, you know, led by our House Speaker, Adrian Jones. Uh, I think that is one of, personally, one of our top priorities, and uh, I expect that we will, uh, we will pass that bill uh, again, and we'll override the veto um, if he vetoes it again. <laughs> So uh, on the environmental front, um, so there is a great bill uh, called the Community Choice Energy Act. Uh, this is Delegate Charcutian's bill. It's a local bill making it through our uh, delegation. This is a bill that passed last year as a pilot program for Montgomery County in the House, but in our shortened legislative session, wasn't able to make it through in the Senate. So it's come back this year, but it's a way of for Montgomery County to collectively pool all of our uh, energy consumption, electricity consumption, and select green energy as the source, renewable energy. Um, and if you think of all of the homes, all the businesses, and how much we consume, that would just be a huge, uh, create a huge demand for uh, renewable and clean energy and benefit uh, green jobs. So that that's one of, I think, the uh, 
the most important environmental bills that, that it's going to go through uh, affecting Montgomery County and the state. Well, at this point, uh, Senator uh, Susan Lee, Delegate Al Carr, I want to thank you both for uh, not only providing us an incredibly comprehensive overview of what's going on this session, but really for your dedication to public service. I mean, at this time, it is real, especially on the, the strains that the, that, that Marylanders are under and the strains you're under personally as just citizens of this great state and, and for the leadership you're providing and for trying to make it work, especially under such difficult circumstances and meeting this, the needs of so many people. I always have believed that serving that public service is an incredibly noble profession. And I really thank you both from the bottom of my heart for representing not our, the Maryland Jewish community with such um, effectiveness and for the warmth and openness of the relationship that we've always had with you and your uh, uh, you personally and with your offices and wish you uh, a very successful session and, and good health and happiness in the new year. Um, let me, and to your family and loved ones of two, of course, um, let me pass this on now to my friend and to the co-chair of the Maryland, uh, of the Maryland Commission, Todd Rosenberg, for closing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Senator Lee and Delegate Carr for sharing your time and expertise with us and for your deep commitment to our Jewish community and its priorities. We look forward to many more years of friendship and partnership. We invite all of you to join us on Wednesday, January 27th at 8.30 a.m. for the final event of this legislative series. We will be joined by Montgomery County Executive Mark Elrich, County Council President Tom Hucker, and County Council Vice President Gabe Albernaz. This legislative series is free and open to the public. It is, however, not possible for the JCRC to provide this level of programming or to do the advocacy work that we do without ongoing support. Sponsorship opportunities for this series are available for $180. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Marilyn Wind, Richard Goldstein, Jennifer Mizrahi, Jocelyn Kriftcher, Hillary Smith Kapner, Bobby Schulman, and Stein Sperling for their sponsorship and also to wish the Kriftcher family our condolences on the recent loss. If you would like to join them in sponsoring the remaining webinars in our legislative series, you can give a gift on our website at jcouncil.org. Thank you for sharing this morning with us. We look forward to seeing you on the 27th, and we wish you and your family a happy and healthy new year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Stay Thanks safe all. and well. You too. Thank you for your service.